Now let's give a precise definition of analytic continuation. Let f1 of z and f2 of z are analytic functions in domains omega 1 and omega 2 respectively. Suppose these domains have a non-zero intersection. And function f1 and f2 coincide on this domain. Then f2 of z is called analytic continuation of f1 of z to domain omega 2, and vice versa. To understand better this definition, let's study some simple example. Consider the following function f1 of z equals z minus z squared plus z cubed minus z to 4 plus and so on, which can be conveniently put under the sum sign like this, negative 1 to n times z to n plus 1. The radius of convergence of the series is 1. So the series defines a function analytic inside a unit disk centered at point z equals 0. And let's denote this domain, the unit disk, as omega 1. Now let's consider another function, f2 of z equals z over 1 plus z. Well, this function is defined in the entire complex plane with the only exception of point z equals negative 1, which is obviously a simple pole. And let's call this second domain of analyticity omega 2. Well, the intersection of these two domains, omega 1 and omega 2, is simply equal to omega 1. And the function f2 of z coincides with the function f1 of z inside this unit circle. Why? Because f1 of z is a convergent Taylor series of the function f2 of z inside this unit disk. And that means that function f2 of z is an analytic continuation of function f1 of z in the entire complex plane with the exception of point z equals negative 1. One may wonder if it's possible to construct a different function, let's call it f2 bar of z, such that it coincides with f1 function inside the unit circle, but is different from f2 of z. A rather amazing and extremely powerful statement concerning the analytic continuation tells that as soon as it exists, it's unique. This statement is essentially analogous to so-called identity theorem for analytic functions. And the theorem goes as follows. Given two functions, f and g of z, analytic inside some open and connected domain d. Now suppose there is some subdomain s, which belongs to d. And f and g coincide on S. Then f and g functions coincide in the entire domain D, provided that this subdomain S contains the accumulation point. Another perspective is that analytic function is entirely determined by its failures inside a single open neighborhood in D, or even a countable subset in D, provided that the subset contains an accumulation point. And to illustrate this idea, let's study some very neat example. Suppose we have a countable subset in the complex plane defined by the equation zn equals 1 over 2n, where n is an arbitrary non-zero integer. Let's call this subset S. And let's define a function such that f1 of zn equals 0 in, on all these points. And now let's try to build an analytic continuation of this function to some region in a complex plane. Well, the first one seems to be pretty trivial. g1 of z equals 0 in the entire complex plane. But what about an attempt to try something less trivial? Say, let's consider the function g2 of z equals sine of pi by z. Then, as you see, g2 of zn also vanishes for points zn equals 1 over n. And now it seems that we build two analytic continuations of a single function. So something went wrong. Let's try to understand what exactly. So if we take a closer look at our series, we immediately notice that it contains an accumulation point, namely z equals 0. It's a limiting point of this subset as n goes to infinity. But this is precisely the point where our g2 function has an essential singularity, because sine of pi over 0 is ill-defined. 
And this is where the conditions of our theorem are broken. Because the theorem tells us that the subset S should have an accumulation point belonging to the domain of analyticity of our function. But this is not true here. That is why we have to put up with the trivial analytic continuation g1 equals 0. And now let's get back to our first example. There we managed to build an analytic continuation from the insides of the unit disk into almost the entire complex plane. Well, things can't get any simpler, can they? Well, other possibilities still exist. And as a classical example, let's consider the following function. Function f1 of z is given by the following series from 0 to plus infinity, z to n factorial. Again, a simple ratio test tells us that the function has a convergence radius equals 1. So this series defines the function analytic inside the unit disk. Well, the uniqueness of this function is that as it happens, it can't be analytically continued anywhere outside this unit disk. And to see this, let's study this function more attentively. As it turns out, this function has a singularity at each root of unity. You can prove it by yourself as a small exercise. But that means that any point on a unit circle of an appearance e to 2 pi i q, where q is an arbitrary rational number, is a singularity of this function. But from this we conclude that any arc of this unit circle, however small, contains an infinite amount of singularities. And as it happens, one is unable to bypass this fence of singularities and to continue analytically this function anywhere beyond this circle. But fortunately, such beasts are rather rare in complex analysis and we won't encounter that function in our future examples. But still, the examples such as the first one are also quite rare. So let's study something more realistic. And let's get to our first problem 1.10. So let's consider our now familiar series. Let's denote it as f1 of z. Negative 1 to n divided by 2n times z minus 1 to n. As we discussed earlier, this series defines an analytic function inside the unit disk centered at point z equals 1. So let's call this domain omega 1. Now let's consider another function f2 of z equals to 1 half of logarithm of z on the right complex semi-plane with imaginary axis excluded. Let's call this domain omega 2. And the intersection of these two domain is equal to omega 1, the unit disk. Function f2 coincides with function f1 inside the unit disk because, again, f1 is a converging Taylor series of f2 on this unit disk. And that means that f2 is an analytic continuation of f1 on the right complex semi-plane. And as we now understand from the theorem which we discussed, the analytic continuation of f1 to a larger domain omega 2 is unique. It's just one half of logarithm of z, where the regular branch of complex logarithm is specified in such a way that f2 of 1 is equal to 0. But can we go further and build an analytic continuation to, say, a different region, like this? And the answer is no. And to understand better what fails here, let's recall what exactly we mean by the logarithm of a complex argument z. Our practice with regular branches tells us that in order to construct a single valued function, which we may call a logarithm, we need to draw a branch cut. And we have to conclude that the largest domain to which our initial function f1 of z can be analytically continued is the entire complex plane with a branch cut, the one which of course doesn't cross the initial domain. And there are many ways to draw this branch cut, there are many associated analytical continuations. It seems natural to draw a branch cut along the real negative semi-axis. And let's call the corresponding domain, the entire complex plane with this cut, omega 3. And the corresponding analytical continuation of function f1 of z over this domain, f3 of z. And now we may determine its value above and below the branch cut at point z equals negative 1. Well, this is a very simple task, we already did it when we studied the regular branches of the logarithm, and I'll just give you again the answers. f3 of negative 1 plus i0 is simply i pi by 2, while f3 of negative 1 minus i0 is negative i pi by 2. As a result, our final example shows us 
that the analytic continuation is possible, but we need to be very careful with the choice of the domain. The cut is needed to single out a particular regular branch of the logarithmic function to render it single valued. As we will see later, even this limitation can be bypassed, but we need to study more the theory of multivalued functions and introduce the concept of a Riemann surface. But let's postpone this very interesting adventure for a while. Now let's address more non-trivial examples of analytic continuations and uh, separation of regular branches. So, till our next slide.